thanks for joining us everyone. Um, my name is Louisa Butler and I'm one of the co-producers for the Architecture Fringe. Um, I'm here with Shona Common and Cam Chan. Um, welcome to Practice Practice Roundtable 2 on Learning Architecture Looking Out, um, which forms part of the Architecture Fringe 2021 core programme. Um, the provocation for this year's Architecture Fringe is unlearning uh, and we invite you to unlearn with us. Um, to interrogate your own beliefs, behaviours and biases in order to acknowledge how the world really is and then to reimagine how it could be. The Practice Practice project seeks to explore current conditions of practice for architects and those working with or for the built environment and through a process of unlearning and building anew, generate speculative proposals for future practice, its values, systems and modes of operation. Uh, tonight is the last of two roundtable discussions as we look outward towards practice, towards the delivery and output of architecture where our contributors will be considering how practitioners can think beyond the horizons of traditional practice and consider alternate pathways or disciplines we can learn from to practice architecture in the future. Um, and I'll hand over to Shona. Hi there. Uh, so we're delighted to be joined this evening by our inspiring provocateurs Ben, Sasha and Sean from My Heart Club, Claire Jamieson from Public Practice and Roberta Marcaccio from the Architects After Architecture book, uh, who will each contribute a short provocation and engage in discussion with our facilitator for this evening, Chris Speed, Chair of Design Informatics at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Chris. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and to thank you for inviting me to do this, um, Sean and Louisa. It's a, and Neil, uh, it's an utter pleasure. Um, yeah, so I'm a chair of design informatics, which uh, is just an academic phrase for hanging on to some skill set in the world, because I'm not sure what I contribute to um, anymore, but we like to invent these titles. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting pleasure. Thank you very much for letting me host. Um, I think it's a fantastic question we have. And of course, um, last week's panel, which talked about unlearning, I think within architecture, and of course, this tonight we're looking out. So the, the panellists, um, from iHeart Blob, um, through public practice, and through architects after architecture, are really connected to this question of what happens in the world. Um, when we talk about research practices, we often talk about two phases, research on the world, as though you're watching it from the outside, and then in the world. Um, and as a design academic, I'm not an architect, I should qualify this quickly, um, but I believe in in-the-world research and in-the-world practice. So I'm very, very keen to explore how all of our panellists explore and take this idea of unlearning after studying, um, being in the world, learning that architecture perhaps wasn't quite as tight as the RIBA or the ARB set out because actually you're all involved in many, many different forms of architecture, defining and redefining it as an idea around not just constructing architectures of built, but constructing social capital, um, as well as architectural capital, economic capital, and then cultural capital. What does it mean? What does it take? And where has your learning really taken you on journeys um, beyond that which you thought was part of the project initially to begin to start redefining so that we can ask questions about what the future is of, of unlearning a, a type of architecture. How do we become extended through different skill sets to offer transferable and recognizable value beyond um, that which was perhaps the part of the construction industry? Um, can practitioners be encouraged to think beyond the horizons of traditional practice? And therefore, what skills do you need to bring and on board as much as pass on to others? How is the architect and profession stereotyped? Have you managed to escape these stereotypical ideas of what architects are, what your social role is, what your function, and how can we explore new possibilities for architectural thinking, constructing and being to respond to the crises of time? Is architecture relevant um, in the eyes of the public and are they demanding of you particular assumptions that you want to break down? Um, so uh, yeah, terrific. It's gonna be a fantastic um, journey. So the order of play, um, I believe is Roberta's going to go first and she's going to present for 10-15 um, minutes a series of slides ending with a provocation then she's going to hand over to Claire who's again going to do the same present a series of slides 
um, which set out her stall and then leads with a provocation at the end. Um, and then hand over to uh, the last team, um, our I Heart Blob, who's then going to offer again their stall, set out their perspectives, and then finish with a provocation. And then we'll get a conversation going. And perhaps I'll start by picking up these particular three provocations which each panelist has introduced and then use that to let a conversation going and then introduce the audience as much as we can because it's great doing a meeting a zoom meeting not just a webinar so i think without further ado i'm going to hand it to roberta who's going to take us on a journey um, and, and we've asked everybody to self-introduce there's no point chris trying to blag you um, we're in a meeting so i'll let people introduce so over to you roberta and i think spotlight will move from me on to Roberta. And okay, so I'm an editor, an educator at the Architecture Association in London, and a research consultant working for uh, various architectural practices. So, as Chris mentioned, I'm here this evening as a co editor of this book, Architects After Architecture Alternative Pathways for Practice, which is a project I worked on with Harry Harris, who's the Dean of Architecture at Pratt in New York, and Rory Hyde, who's Associate Professor of Architecture at the University of Melbourne. Now, I'm just going to reverse the order a little bit and actually start with my provocation, but I'll go back to that at the end. So my provocation tonight is that architecture is irrelevant. And the reason why architecture is irrelevant is that we architects insist on describing what we do in terms of buildings. and I believe it's only by unlearning to do this, thus the coupling our practice from building, that we can really spell out our true value to society and stop being seen as just as providers of luxury services for to improve the marketability of the developer's project. And instead, we should start putting emphasis on the skills that we possess, which are a certain flexibility of mind, the capacity to bridge between different forms of knowledge and communities, and above all, I believe, the capacity of sitting with uncertainty. And this is crucial because it's a key skill in dealing with the complexity, the increasing complexity of our contemporary world. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's talk about the housing crisis, for instance. So if we keep focusing on the object, the house, we say things like, oh, we have to build more houses. And so what we do as architects is like, we lower the construction costs, we make smaller units, um, which are all things that do not actually solve the housing crisis, they just develop a product which is a bit less good. Um, to tackle this problem instead, we have to look for instance, at things like the relationship between housing and economy between housing and banking and to look at the price of land which is going up and these are questions that as architects we can only ask if we shift the focus from the building to these bigger questions now the book this is largely the thesis of the work and this is why i brought it forward first now i'm just going to take you through the book so how it came about um, originally we were the three of us were approached by the RBA actually to compile a sort of manual for part two architecture students. So something which would cover everything from procurement to billing your clients, to work, how you track working hours, how you get work, et cetera. And so as we set out to produce this snapshot of contemporary practice, we realized that actually there was a, best, a better story to be told, another story to be told. And this was the fact that the number of architects who either leave architecture or redefine what they do is a very high one. So for instance, our BA Educational Statistics shows that in the UK, more than half of the students who have completed the part two just do not go on registering as architects. So what do they end up doing? We don't often hear their stories. And you know, why should we? Like, what is the point of seven years of vocational training if then you don't even register as an architect, right? This is just not the type of thing that, that schools like to write in their prospectuses. And so rather than sweeping these cohort under a carpet and just pretend they don't, they don't exist and let students find their own way, we decided to map their careers, their alternative careers. And we start asking, what if we acknowledge this 
pathways, these diverse pathways, as a sign of success, and rather than a failure for living the profession, as a sign of the broader applicability of architectural thinking beyond the act of making building, and beyond, above all, a rigid definition of the profession, which says that basically after you graduate, you end up working in a private practice, usually in an urban center, producing buildings for people who can afford it. So needless to say, this provocation didn't down too well with the RBA, which decided not to publish our book, and therefore we found another publisher. But then this was 2019, so and then the pandemic kicked off, and this gave us even more confidence that this was the right time to bring this project to the fore. So the book seeks to answer a simple question, which is what can you do with a degree in architecture? And we give 40 answers, so first the answers in the form of essays, of interviews, and of case studies. And we, we group these answers into two sections, plus and beyond. So at the center of this diagram on the screen, you see, um, you see architecture in the sense of traditional practice. And then on the left, you have the plus, which are the people who maybe still describe themselves as architects, but who have reinvented what they do and who they work for. So for instance, you have people who have reorganized their practice around feminist principles to counterbalance a male dominated profession. This is the case of math or of matrix. Or people who have decided to move upstream in the conversations that have to do with the built environment, turning into developers like Roger Zagonovic. Or people who, like we made that, have tapped into the policy realm and they've started doing strategic design work for local council. Then on the other side, on the right, you have the beyond, which are the people who have trained in architecture, but they do not describe themselves as architects anymore. And they've gone on applying their architectural skills to other fields. So this is the case of people like Matt Johns, for instance, who is the head of design at Google, or Miriam Bellad, who designs video games, or Shelley Penn who's in politics, or architects who work for the refugee communities or who have turned into public servants. Now, many of these people made the jump out of conventional practice in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008, which was a moment where the architectural profession was in flux, there was the, the scale of unemployment was really high, and, and the, for the viability of practice seems more in doubt. And this is a situation which perhaps echoes the one that we're about to witness due to COVID. But um, a lot of the contributors to our book sort of lament the frustration with standard practice stemming from this period around things like how long it takes for a project to be built, so how slow architecture is, around the issue of scale. It's like, unlike technology, which is a field that a lot of people have jumped into, um, unlike technology, um, the scale that, of impact that you're able to have is, is limited. You can't change the world one building at a time. And then the, the last complaint has to do with the ethical agenda of architecture. So just let me quickly give you some examples. Um, we have Chris Hildry, who has used his architectural training to help homeless people. So for instance, like he realized that um, homelessness was a problem that had to do with the fact that when you, uh, when you become a homeless person, you lose an address. And by losing an address, you lose access to a whole series of, uh, of services that you actually need in order to be a member of society, like for instance, healthcare, like for instance, a bank, bank account, which paradoxically, if you don't get, then you won't be able to get back into society. Um, and so he found a way of recoupling homeless people with addresses which are currently unoccupied across the country. Um, another practice that is featured in the book is water and they want to address sustainability and they realized that in order to do that we have to rethink the role of architects within the construction industry and around so for instance they rethought the way we define waste um, 
waste coming from the construction industry. And they sought to, um, to figure out a way in which architects can easily reuse materials coming from demolition, but also a ways of expanding the responsibility of the architect beyond the construction process and into the life of the building and even its death, it's the construction. Um, and then finally, we have another example that I want to bring to you is Robert Moll's Global Free Unit, which is an organization that places architectural students in difficult contexts of deprivation of displacement of political uncertainty that creates a crisis and allows them to gain credits for the work that they do that, that they can use to work state graduation. So just to conclude, together these various contributions to our book recast the figure of the architect as a mediator rather than a sort of Randian hero who wants to impose his will on the world in the form, in the form in, with elaborate forms basically. Um, and really forced us to question the nature of architecture itself so we as architects like to pretend that it's just buildings, but that's a convenient fiction that we tell ourselves to make the story a bit easier to digest. But my question to you is what would happen if we were to redefine what we do, not by its product, but by a way of thinking. But if, and if we were to redefine our value to be knowledge rather than the production of buildings. So this is a bit of a rhetorical question because as you might have understood from the presentation of the book, we as editors believe that it's only by going beyond the building and by reframing our work around the public good and around the way of thinking that we can really demonstrate our true value to society and recover architectural, cultural, social and political agency, which has been lost in these years. Thank you very much for listening and I'm going to hand over to Claire. I'm Claire Jameson, I'm the R&D manager at Public Practice and I'm also, I'm one of those forgotten part two non-architects that Roberta was just talking about. So I'm two thirds of an architect and then I found a career um, influencing or shaping the built environment which doesn't involve designing buildings. So it follows on very nicely. So for me, it was first in a think tank, then academia and now research more closely tied to practice in particular planning and city making with public practice. So those of you who haven't come across public practice before, um, we're a social enterprise and we place architects, urbanists and planners, many from the private sector into public sector roles. And in those, in those roles, their placements as we call them, they spend 10% of their time contributing to a collective R&D programme, which is the part of the organisation I run. So these are bi-weekly Fridays spent together as a cohort. And I'll be talking more about that in my presentation. So I wanted to start with a statistic which is really um, what public practice is founded upon. So this kind of massive sea change that happened in the late 1970s and 80s, which saw architects moving away from the public sector. Um, the sector which in, in the previous two decades, the 50s and the 60s, had really been the centre of innovation in architecture and planning. Young architects were graduating from architecture school and they were drawn to the sector because it offered really the opportunity to build a better society after the war. And it was in this context that they had they'd begun to have this extraordinary agency that, that was not possible to have outside the public sector where they were not just designing buildings, but designing their own briefs and also the services that were encompassed by this new architecture. So effectively giving form to the welfare state. Um, this most recent statistic shows not only the move towards private enterprise and private practice, which was adv advanced by Thatcher in the 1980s, amongst other drivers, um, and which obviously kind of now dominates um, contemporary architectural practice, but it also speaks to the reputation of the public sector as being this somewhat stale or bureaucratic sort of area of, of our society. And this narrative of a slow, unimaginative public sector has dominated discourse since, since the 70s, really. And it's this perception that public practice seeks to reverse. So learning, unlearning, taking the, the language of the title of this roundtable, um, the R&D programme. So, so our associates, that's what we call um, the architects and urbanists who come from the private sector into these roles, our associates spend 
90% of their time working in-house within councils in roles that span planning, regeneration, urban design, community engagement, infrastructure, sustainability, you know, the whole gamut of the built environment, really. Um, and the remaining 10% of their time they spend um, taking part in the collective R&D programme as a cohort. And the R&D programme itself is, is a programme of learning, which enables associates to unlearn some of their preconceptions about the public sector and the ways of working that they've taken with them from the private sector. Um, and to, to learn new ways of working, a new language, a new pace, really it's a whole new culture. And it's a mode of learning embedded in practice. It's situated outside the academy and it's grounded in the creation of this multidisciplinary community of practice. And a lot of it is rooted in soft skills and a process of um, enculturation into the sector. So we talk about developing the qualities of a public planner. They might be initiative, empathy, humility, perspective, resilience, those sort of soft skills which I think are transferable and are, are the kind of skills that architects already have and it's about kind of reframing them. So the learning philosophy that underpins our R&D programme is um, centred on an experiential mode of learning. It's embedded in the world of practice and among fellow practitioners. It's self-directed, it's generous and it's open to processes of iteration, testing, failure, debate and disagreement. And at its core, it's learning which is directed toward the common good for public purpose. So our fortnightly R&D days are about learning from each other and the other brilliant officers within local authorities who are doing amazing work. Um, and it's about immersing, um, immersion into a place. So each R&D day is hosted by a different local authority. And we, we learn from place. We use three, the 360 degree model of hearing from stakeholders from across a project. So the developers, the councillors, the officers, the community and so on. And pre-COVID, we spent some of that time within council offices and council chambers as well, absorbing that culture of weird coffee urns and stale air and sometimes quite unpleasant buildings. But it's, it's all part of that culture and the kind of the brilliant pomp of those more formal spaces of decision making. The programme sort of purposefully moves away from um, a model of sort of top down education towards co learning. So the community of practice is at the heart of the programme and it's a social form of learning, creating cohorts of practitioners who are going on the same journey of learning or perhaps relearning, whose identities as practitioners are shifting as they find new roles within a more socially embedded practice. As part of the R&D programme, associates also work on collaborative practice-based research, we call practice notes, um, and these are tools, templates, edits to clauses, processes, so they're kind of small but tangible changes to the way that we plan. They're often in the form of Excel sheets or Word documents, so they're, they're downloadable tools that council officers can use straight away. Um, they're purposefully anti-academic, they aren't scholarly essays or think pieces, and as a body of work, the kind of the longer term greater aim is that they become a kind of collective R&D for the sector, so a library of resources which are gradually pushing practice forward. Um, a series of core, what we call enduring understandings, shape our program of learning and unlearning. And these are the values we hope our associates will take away from the program. And gradually through our advocacy as public practice, we hope that the, the sector and the public more broadly will come to understand and to kind of unlearn their perceptions of local government. I'm gonna kind of talk you through these, um, what we might call new learnings if we're taking the again the, the language of the title of this round table and these kind of form part of my provocation really so the public sector can be bold and enterprising there's a proud history of public sector the public sector driving innovation and excellence the state is not only about maintaining status quo everyday places can be extraordinary 
planning has the power to build better everyday environments for everyone. Rather than creating exception to the norm, we work to raise the standards of normality itself. The rules can be designed. Bureaucracy is not a constraint on creativity. It's a field for a cre creativity in its own right. Even meeting minutes, procurement processes, or legal clauses are opportunities for better design. Shaping places means shaping decision-making. There's no point in designing the right answer to the wrong brief. So we work upstream to influence the decisions which have the greatest impact on places. Diverse planners make diverse places. Places and their populations are complex and don't benefit from being simplified. We value the diversity of the places we plan and reflect the diversity of the people we plan for. Planning builds democracy. Every citizen should have a say in how their city changes. We listen hard to people that are engaged and engage people that aren't being heard. And then lastly, planners are stewards of the future. There's an urgent need for long-term thinking and we can only act sustainably by, by planning for broader communities, wider geographies and longer horizons. So my final slide, which I guess is my, my question that I'm kind of putting out there to the rest of the panel and the audience. So I think our associates are motivated to join the public sector sort of primarily by that desire to move upstream, to be the one writing the brief rather than the one fulfilling the brief, and also to be agents of much longer term change. And I think through their roles, they begin to encounter a series of kind of opposing priorities, which I think not only shape these kind of public sector concerns that I've talked about, but also perhaps start to shape the expanded field of architecture. So that conflict between making an immediate impact and planning for the longer term, change from the inside or agitating from the outside, taking control or giving freedom, enabling others or doing it yourself, taking risks or playing safe, complying, challenging. So the question I'd like to Sort of finish with with is through practice how can we reconcile opposing priorities and what tools do we need to do so so that's it from me handing over to ben sasha and sean i heart blob we are i heart blob i'm sean this is sasha <laughs> and ben is over there as well you see our screen so we are i heart blob um we call ourselves a uh, mixed reality architecture studio and it's yeah as sean said it's me sean and ben and we all met in vienna in 2016 and we decided to start this practice and first it was actually um just kind of a social media platform it was our um place to exhibit our work so we decided to do every day it's like many design students at that time uh, we decided to, to take up this challenge and do every day. Um, we were making an object every day alongside some theoretical text and with uh, architectural theory. And um, it was it's quite different. And we started with 100 and quite soon it became thousands of, of objects and uh, small projects, uh, really. It was such a big um, field of work that the projects uh, ranged from product design to architectural objects to installations. And first uh, we started with abstracts and um, sooner we moved into more detailed architectural um, projects where we slowly started adding uh, constraints. And as you can see, <laughs> eventually we moved into a more detailed state and more architectural, where you would see um, a ground constraints, uh, where it would be a building or within urban environment, within a uh, nature environment. And these speculative objects and projects uh, got so much attention, we had um, incredible chances to talk with uh, a social media community. And people like famous architects, philosophers, we had an ama amazing conversations and it really helped us to develop our research and practice, actually talking with the community and 
developing projects in that way. And at some point we created so many um, objects that we decided to feed those into a machine learning algorithm and let we let AI to design objects for ourselves. At some point, uh, our faces became the uh, canvas for our projects. So we would change and these um, augmented reality filters would um, be architectural projects in, in, in themselves, but um, as augmented reality filters, which also could be used by the rest of the community. Uh, this is quite interesting uh, where when we actually deployed these architectural augmented uh, objects into the world and we placed those blobs, augmented blobs everywhere around the world in Estonia, uh, America, Vienna, UK uh, and so on. And now you can still find them somewhere in the urban environments. And that was probably maybe a starting point for actually decentralizing our um, architectural workflow, actually placing them uh, in augmented reality. Yeah, I can I can pick up from here. Sasha, I don't know, the videos show quite slow on my side, but maybe it's just uh, my connection. But if you go to the next slide, I think what, what Sasha has described now is this trying to understand the link between different technologies, whether it's AI or AR or, or different kind of ideas about fragmented views of architecture and society and theory and how these might piece together into a somewhat coherent look at our practice. And what we really gravitated towards is this idea of augmented reality, because what we felt is that in a way, the phone now can act as a liminal scanner between these realities and that the domain of architecture in a sense is inherently spatial and formal and whether or not that's physical or digital, that distinction begins to blur and to juxtapose and complement each other. So in this particular project, which is shown here, um, we designed a digital per, uh, Baroque pavilion. So if you go to the next slide here, um, part of the idea in, in this commission is we wanted to push the boundaries of what people know as architecture. So rather than something static or concrete, we wanted to change that into something dynamic, changing and updating. And for us again here, augmented reality was the, the technology that enabled us to do this in a kind of fundamentally formal and spatial way. In a way, it, it even changes the way that makes architecture closer to software than we previously thought. And so through this pavilion, we were able to have it grow and expand, shift scales, and even begin to fundamentally interact with someone. So their distance to the pavilion the way they moved the camera would have effects on the architecture. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, and I think this starts to, to develop a line of thinking that is pretty key for us. And that's this idea that through these technologies, we can start to engage in different types of interactions with users and inhabitants of the architecture. So this is a different pavilion we designed where we wanted to juxtapose the physical tactile quality of what uh, we are calling the noodles here. They were large uh, objects made from recycled parachutes uh, stuffed with hay, and they had a very kind of tactile nature to them. But at the same time, their position uh, and the way they were arranged, which anybody who went to the installation could rearrange them, would have an effect on where augmented reality content was shown. And so this was very this was very nice. And all of a sudden, uh, you could go to this site, you could take photos of yourself with the site, and you could leave these memories there, whether they're sketches or photos or, or little um, icons that we had designed. And we wanted to create this digital sense of place, which really started to emerge from this uh, installation. And what's particularly interesting is, uh, if you go to the next slide, Sasha, that the installation eventually uh, was taken down and, and moved on, but the digital sense of place that people had left there remained. So people could still go and see these memories that, uh, that existed at one time of a place of people engaging with the, with the objects um, that no longer was there. And so I think this was a really, a really nice 
component of the exhibition that's not typically what maybe we would think of and certainly would not be possible with, with being limited to only physical architecture. And I think the pandemic has in many ways um, taken this view a bit further. So this pavilion, which is currently um, on display in Toronto, um, so it, it again, it uses AR as a way to engage people into a, into a community, but allows them to do so in a socially distanced way. So uh, in this case, there were some uh, interesting requirements for the uh, setup of the pavilion, including here where we use the AR as a way to even um, allow the construction company to, to build it in a way that was easier to understand. And so we could make real-time updates to the, to the design and push changes through Instagram, they would download our filters off of Instagram and could uh, update their design uh, in real time. So I think it, it kind of starts to open for us, this integration of physical and digital starts to open up new architectural possibilities from this. And it's repositioning a little bit, this perception that architecture is stoic and archaic and to further this, often we really love these kind of colorful forms and digital defaults uh, like flattened cylinders, cubes and hearts because this invites people into kind of a warm and inviting landmark rather than, um, rather than what we might traditionally think of as, as architecture. So kind of carrying on a little bit from where Ben left off, this idea of, I guess, static architecture and the, the fact that we are moving quite quite rapidly away from this, this notion of um, something that is quite stagnant. We were then kind of, I guess, tasked with the opportunity, I guess, to, to design a book and release a publication. But then obviously the first instance of what happens when you have a publication is that it's frozen. It's, it's printed and basically it's not updatable. It's not changeable. It doesn't have any way to really interact with it. So one way to combat this was we designed an augmented reality application that goes hand in hand with the publication, which means that the book itself never is static. We can constantly push updates to the application. And then we're continuing this narrative or this discussion that we've been having that architecture is more or could be more closely aligned, aligned with um, technology rather than uh, it's something that is, again, static. So it gives us a more, I guess, a closer link to architecture as an idea of, of software um, rather than, yeah, this static kind of uh, embodiment of, of concreteness that we, we kind of sometimes associate with architecture or quite often associate with architecture. So to take this further, uh, we've been, as many have been, uh, quite involved in the, the non-fungible token space, looking into how architects and artists can fundamentally transform the way that we distribute, I guess, in some ways, uh, space, but also how we can utilize these new monetary systems for things like crowdfunding, and also how we can start to break away from the constraints that we're seeing clearly within the, uh, the planning permission processes and within uh, community-based discussions and, and things like this that start to break down this idea of architecture coming from a community or uh, out to a community. Here we're able to distribute our architecture without any constraints, straight to the public, straight to the people that want to actually purchase or envision themselves within uh, these cities or spaces. So we designed this decentralized city that kind of tried to embody this, this uh, opportunity of someone to own uh, or purchase uh, an entire city, which for us is that fundamental, I guess, option to change the way that we think about architecture from the physical into the digital and kind of transform that, that narrative. So you can see here that this space is completely accessible and, and virtual, which kind of transforms in some ways we're considering the idea of Zoom that's this flattened two dimensional representation of space where we can actually start to position ourselves as virtual architects that take on, I guess, new, new discussions of architecture to try and push beyond this notion of physicality or pure physicality, which obviously pertains to that notion of stagnant uh, architecture. See, we're using a similar narrative, we're using these articulate forms 
form, the forms of interaction or animations that start to enable this architecture to change as people move through it. And here are some, some stills and a more, I guess, realistic visualization moving beyond this kind of game environment and visualizing what these types of spaces might be through hyper-realistic visualizations. Because we're kind of in the, in the mode of imagining that there is the potential that we will inhabit these virtual spaces or hybrid spaces. And of course, at the moment, we're either at AAA level game visualizations that are really inaccessible unless you have a powerful PlayStation, Xbox, or, or, or computer. Um, but obviously, there's a, a move as technology gets faster, it gets better, then this kind of real immersion becomes far more accessible. And to kind of extend on from the augmented reality discussion, within this notion of decentralization or the non-fungible token space, we started minting our very own augmented reality filters, which allow some of these works to, to be sold, distributed, earn money for others as well, um, and directly be sold on the blockchain, which are basically these virtual experiences that people can start to place in their own environments and hybridize the, the physical world that we're, we're currently living in. And for our... I guess part of our pro provocation is that architecture must unlearn physicality. And we'll, we'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Really fascinating. And there's a number of themes I think I can just get rolling, but I'm really conscious that, that this, is a, this isn't a webinar. So I do want to bring in some of the questions um, from Thomas, from Andrew, from um, Claire, who's asking back questions, and Helena. So if you don't mind, uh, chair's privilege, I'll get things going, um, but I will return and I promise. The problem is you've got, a, you've got Chris, who's got a cognitive load at watching the chat, as well as also convening. So I'll keep an eye on things as best I can. What I wanted to start with, going back to Roberta, is this sense of product. Now, um, I hadn't thought about, I always thought, I always thought that architecture was a service industry, really because you were providing shelter. And I hadn't occurred to me that actually the objectification of buildings, houses, as things might have been a barrier to your discipline. And I'm curious about each of you, how you, you've all made that turn, you see. You've all introduced this turn toward service dominant logic, something that says, let's dismantle the idea of the building being product, which might impede the chance for you to be interdisciplinary, to moving in different places. So, Roberta, I want this idea then um, that it really does stop us. It stops a discipline. Where does that start? And, and, and are you seeing any turns toward it being dismantled? Well, to some extent, the book is a <laughs> is a start, like an opening up, like showing things that are already underway in terms of dismantling this way of working and dismantling the object as the primary output of architects' endeavours. Um, but I think the main obstacle probably to all this is, is the contract. As really? In, as, in, as an architect, you bill your clients for a proportion, a very low proportion, of the construction cost of a building. Mm -hmm. So until that is in place like we can't really you know say so, i mean I, i'm kind of like tempted to ask uh you guys how you build your clients as well because that would be like until we, we're able to to go beyond the construction value of a building the construction materials like all this stuff basically mm -hmm. we can't really build for the research that we do which is actually much more important we can build for our soft skills that we might bring into the conversation which are our true value and so i think there was a question also in the audience about like you know whether there is a uh, a sort of body like the rba but for alternative careers and i'm like i don't know if there should be <laughs> maybe it's better if there isn't one as in maybe we can invent other ways of regulating how things like we build clients or how we get new projects etc 
That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, and, and Claire, you pre- I think you hit this head on by saying, look, we're going to go straight to the public sector because the public sector has to be understood as services. I mean, we 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 elect governments um, and and we we support politicians sometimes because of their the, the things they wear on the sleeve. But essentially, what we're doing is recruiting services. Um, to support us in daily lives. And again, the, the role of the architect then, I think you're being very specific and saying, let's put the architect back into that place, not to build the star buildings, the signature buildings, but to support the underlying services for the living. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, very few of our public practice associates are involved in designing buildings. A few of them are, but most of them are, you know, their master planning or they're writing a brief or they're working with housing delivery to kind of set up the right procurement structures to make sure you get you know the right number of units at the right sort of square footage it's it's much more what comes before the architecture and sometimes it's also about um saying actually there doesn't need to be a building here there needs to be a better green space or you know there needs to be some community resource or some description which is not a building and you can only really I mean I think you can say that as an architect working to a brief as well if if you have the right client but I think it's much easier to say that when you're further upstream that's great so so, so you're a, so I'm going to be pushy so you're a service designers I think I mean that's the breakthrough for me tonight is that hang on let's let's take away the objects and think about what services you support so um Ben and Sasha and Sean is that it's fair to say that you are now moving into the space of service design and do you does your practice reflect that because I'm not sure it does entirely but um how would you feel I mean I think it's it's maybe a bit of a combination and somewhat maybe how you would uh, there's a question in there you know how do we what who is our typical client and and how do we get commissioned so I think there's some of that service involved in the commissioning process uh so so what does for example in our practice what does augmented reality sort of provide someone that they maybe do not typically or, or would not get in an otherwise kind of an installation or a shop front or something like this? But at the end of the day, I think we are still we are still very focused on applying these new technologies into a, a somewhat core focus of architecture around form and space, uh, that being digital and physical mixed form and space. But so I think it you know, it can still be seen as an object, or I don't know if product is really the right word, but it still can be seen as an object uh, in some ways, but a, a mixed reality is one. Is it, I think in, in software, we accept that, um, I, um, I'm trying to think of it, some of the apps on my phone, I understand they're giving me services, but I still have an app. I still have a product to point to, but I, I, I get to the services, right? I mean, whether it's Facebook or a social media, but I, and there's an interesting dialogue that it's very hard to imagine software as service without a thing to point to. But I, I, I balance those both, both out. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think we, I think we often struggle with that balance and, and struggle with the balance of, you know, how, how do we position ourselves when speaking to a new client? And how do we, what are we most interested in also in a commission? You know, are we, are we interested in the experience? Are we interested in the service portions? Are we interested in maybe this kind of uh, product portion or, or object portion? And I'm going to get to, I'm beginning to start bringing slowly some of the questions from the audience in, but I wanted to go to therefore thinking about the skills and Claire, you brought out some of those skills. You, um, you mentioned them rather too fast for me to be able to tweet. Um, but I think you had things like um, humility, resilience, empathy, yeah. and uh, yeah, you're seeing those as core skills then, and um, Thomas might want to come in in a minute about how how what do you get those? What are those skills? What are those skills again? And then perhaps I might bring Thomas in to ask: Do those skills match up his expectations of what he might need in part three? If that makes sense. Mm. The ones I said were initiative, empathy, humility, perspective, and resilience, and they're actually taken from our um, recruitment uh, sort of criteria. So w- when people apply to the program, they're the kind of pillars by which we assess them. So we we're quite, um, I, I guess, in some ways, radical in our recruitment process. That it's multiple rounds, but in the first round, we don't look at people's CVs at all. It's completely anonymized, and we just ask four questions. 
and you have, I think it's 150 words to answer each question. And those are the kind of things we're looking for. So we don't care if you worked for Norman Foster for 20 years or, you know, what brilliant PhD you did. We actually were interested in a demonstration of those softer skills because we know now from the experience we've had that those are the skills that make you successful public servant. Thomas, did you, what do you think? Do you, did you get those skills from university or is it literally, a, I mean, were they even on the table? Um, yeah, I, th yeah, thanks for looking at the question um, and really great presentations, really, um, thanks. Um, yeah, in terms of what I did after architecture, so I ended up working in uh, the third sector with music, so using, uh, basically I'm like a creative practitioner that uses music to work with people who have um, disabilities or additional sport needs, and I think I, I, think I realised that there were a lot of s soft skills around it, but I didn't feel like it was necessarily something that was stressed at university. There was definitely like a kind of, it was the role models that were brought in, you know, we, you, you didn't see so many examples of the type of um, work or roles that um, Claire and Roberta, for example, you guys have been talking about. That, so the people that would come in to do talks or people that you study would be famous architects or they might be maybe master planners, but yeah, there wasn't so much presentation of the softer skills. And so like for me personally, like, the learning about the creative process or learning about how to interact with people in a creative way were really important things. And I never really saw them as being particularly, you know, tied to architecture. I thought they were, you know, part of what we were doing in architecture, but applicable to other subjects. Um, yeah, and I wonder whether having more like visibility on what on different career paths at university, especially because the job market is so um, challenging for graduates these days that you know, you might get knocked back a lot of times applying for jobs and it, it would be very um, reassuring for graduates to know that there are other avenues available for that kind of thing. So, yeah, the, the soft skill sets, I think, I, 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 was, I, I felt aware of them at university, but I wasn't feeling that it was necessarily coming from the university. It was more something that I was noticing. Roberta, are you a, have you been able to introduce after the book and after these ideas, are you able to... I think you work at the AA, if I'm correct. And um, are you able to move the AA and nudge them toward this type of um, adoption of skills which people are recognizing in your in your little, uh, your provocation? You know, a bit of a disclaimer, I have to say that a lot of people featured in the book actually are somehow connected with the AA. So they have studied there or like they're teaching there or like they pass through the place somehow. So I think to credit, I guess credit my institution to say that probably more than others has been able to spell that uh, there are these soft skills that are equally as important that, as the act of making buildings themselves. Um, I think currently what I see in my experience as an educator at AA around a course in history and theory, which is a soft skill, like how you write about buildings, how you dialogue with people about buildings or not about buildings, about other things. And what I see, what I've been seeing in the last years is a bit of a resistance from the students. As in, mm -hmm. I think it goes back to what we were saying earlier about the economic viability of the profession. It's like, if, education is so expensive. If you know that like the possibilities are scarce, once you get out, you get a sense of that, then you just want to cling on what you know. You just want to cling to the idea that, okay, I'm just going to have a simple story. I get out of university, I'm going to start making buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and so the resistance comes also from within, from mm -hmm. the, the, the students themselves, because, you know, understandably they are scared. So I, I think, you were exactly right, Thomas. I think these stories need to be heard. These stories need to be heard in the sense that there is an economic viability to a lot of these, other, of these alternative stories. There are people who, yeah, surely they struggled <laughs> at some point because they had to reinvent everything that they knew about what is it that an architect does. Um, but they found a way, they found a path, and they found a way of, you know, more than making a living, definitely more than surviving. I mean, that is something that products do, isn't it? They offer stories. Um, you know, they offer things from which people can gather around. 
um, whether it's a thing. I, 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 from a Heideggerian idea, in Scotland, we've got Dingwall, which is actually Thing Valley. And Thing Valley um, is a place where tribes or clans would meet to discuss a thing, an event. And I think um, in Scandinavian governments, I think you talk about the ting. So there's this whole idea around sometimes the the 20th century has forced us to think about things as being objects when actually things might just be events. And um, I think what, what you're doing there is quite interesting, thinking about what is the event of architecture and how is the story important for students particularly to hang on to because, yeah, entering the world with a, well, I can't imagine your final crit, your pinup, when it has to be <laughs> a whole bunch of social, um, economic, cultural services, if that makes sense. Um, um, Heart Blob, you've got this, I Heart Blob, you've got this question from Helena, which I think kind of connects because, um, Helena, if, if you're there as well, I wonder if you'd like to ask it because it segues a little bit for me in thinking about, okay, so if, if you offer these services, then perhaps what does a client expect, which I think is quite an interesting question. You, pick, you uh, picture, yes. Helena. I, I, um, thanks very much for all of the presentations this evening. I've really enjoyed listening to you all. Um, if I can be very personal, it's felt like a bit of therapy. Um, uh, and, and it's very nice to hear what I try to do on a daily basis articulated um, uh, very well. Uh, so I, I'm going to, to blatantly steal some of the language that I've been hearing tonight in my day-to-day uh, -day, um, work. So thank you. Um, uh, so, so my question was with, um, I, I really loved the sort of thinking with uh, what you presented uh, the team at iHeartBlob and um, I was kind of, you know, coming from a public, I work at a public sector organisation and uh, I kind of wondered how, how do you get commissioned? <laughs> Does the public sector <laughs> engage with you at all? Um, how, how have you overcome some of those hurdles? And, or is it kind of like private clients that just kind of get it and are a bit more revolutionary? At the, at the beginning, it was mostly- We were like our museum. own clients. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were our own client, I guess, to the- We were making our own briefs and yeah, yeah eventually uh, museums, you can say galleries started yeah. content contacting us on Instagram for like experiences or I don't know, objects. Um, Stuff like this and yeah then, then we done a couple of like solo shows and galleries and things like that as well and at that point we were able to kind of stretch beyond something small or even something on the screen to like a full space or an individual room um, and then it was kind of a progression from there to try and get somebody to pay for us to do something else um, so that's either through um, like competitions for like public artworks and things like that where we kind of I feel like on, on the surface, we look like um, we fit in with the art crew as well. So we just kind of slide under the radar or a little bit. They don't really notice that it's, it's architects coming through. Um, and then we kind of, I guess, put our own spin on most of the things that we're, we're building with a, a strong focus on spatiality and the use of new technologies. I would, I, would, I would add that also depending on who we are looking at as a client, like when it's more a public oriented um, commission, that um, there are different aspects of, of our work that appeal. So for example, sort of orientation and navig navigation are two things that are usually uh, pretty nice. So we were um, with Vienna Design Week, so that was a public uh, commission that, you know, we were able to sort of look at, okay, maybe on, on a on a urban scale, when someone is moving through a city, how they might engage with different objects, how they might engage with even historical buildings within a city. Um, so I think, you know, uh, when, when, when we're engaged with these really new technologies, oftentimes our clients don't really know the, the full capabilities of them. So like Sasha was saying, it's a little bit up to us to make our own clients in the form of educating them with what is possible and even then trying kind of interesting alternative methods. So like, um, like Sean talked about a little bit, you know, can we fund our own pavilion through non-fungible tokens? So can we just simply sort of look at crowdfunding as a new way that architecture can be uh, introduced to the built environment in a, in a decentralized way and, and whatever people buy, which bricks and columns and windows they buy, uh, we can assemble into then a pavilion that, uh, that's on display. 
publicly. So it's a bit of everything, but I think, I think there's so much possibility both in the private commission side, but I think for us, we're, we're also very excited when it's a bit more, not just a private client, but something a bit more public. Yeah. It's been a good, because it's a good, because I think one of the takers I have, um, Ben Session, Sean, is the idea that you're changing the models of consumption for architecture. I think that, that, that so therefore it becomes part of an experience economy, if that's an appropriate term, where in which is closer to gaming, it's closer to tourism, it's closer, which I have a stake, you know, I have a stake in Pokemon Go, but yeah. I don't really have a stake in my neighbor's house. Well, I, I, think, I would say, Chris, that you've, you've nailed it really well, but the thing that we often harp on is that, you know, these are fundamentally architectural ideas about form and space that we are really trying to, to say, okay, you know, in the world today, it's just everything is so digital and, and the world has moved so far and so fast and architecture is in many ways very stoic and very slow like like we've talked about, uh, Roberta and Claire have talked about. And these are ways that we think we can introduce a speed and velocity to architecture. And it's difficult because we are often the ones that have to, ex you know, to, to pave that way and show this is a new financing model. This is a new experience oriented model or this is what happens when you mix service and product together but i think they're they're really at its at their core they're fundamentally formal spatial conceptual um articulations and our feeling is the risk is that if architects are not the ones that are engaged with this you know then then this is going to be something of big tech you know then okay our our cities will be digitally informed by apple and google and uh, and they're not going to have the same kind of depth and, and uh, nuance that an architect's thinking brings. Yes, indeed. Now, we, 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 we work with Niantech a little bit, who launched the Pokemon Go. And, um, yeah, I, I get the feeling there's no architects in Niantech. You know, that, that actually the, the awful Harry Potter world they construct. I mean, I quite like the Pokemon Go. And Cam knows we've got fans in our group who chase the damn things. But you still sense that the sensibility is not toward a spatial, social, material design. So, um, I even, though the, I mean, even though the underlying technology is, so that's yeah. that's where the that's where the real benefit or or incentive for us comes from. Yeah. Pokemon Go in general, though, is incredibly exciting because it brings people towards like certain key points of of cities or of architecture, uh, whether it's for like a, a Pokemon Go battle. You know, like you're, you're going to the gym to fight somebody else and like you end up having like a congregation of people or like in its height, you've seen hundreds of people chasing a Charizard about like Central Park. So it's very architectural in its set and it's uh, in its play, I guess. But we need to kind of consider these as as architects and really consider what are they actually doing, even if it's subconscious. So if there is no architects really at the fundamentals of Pokemon Go, then maybe there should be because we can direct the, the, the game, I guess, in a more spatial way that is more beneficial for the city or more beneficial for the, the architecture that hosts it. It's interesting, isn't it? So, so I'm gonna try and bring Claire and Roberta in around this because, um, but I also want to bring Andrew Campbell in because he's been really good on the chat. So I don't know if we, Cam, if we could appoint that spotlight, Andrew, because I think what, so this is interesting. So. We've also got Claire, which presented an academic, anti-academic, anti-academy. Roberta and me, we're going to defend the role of the academy. We just need to um, develop. And I wonder, Andrew, you've got a, a really vested interest in this because you're asking some good questions. And I wonder if I might use Andrew as a proxy to open up a dialogue between Claire and Roberta about what is the role then, Andrew, of the academy to bring people through? I mean, clearly architectural training is is heavy it's loaded it's um it's um what's the word it's it's approved it's um and if you've been through that how what needs to happen what needs to happen for myself and roberta on the inside and then claire's calls for something different perhaps on the outside um i would also just like to say that i'm, uh, I'm a practicing architect as well so i kind of see my academic role as sort of well 50 percent of, of what i do um so definitely i don't probably speak as as um fluently as some academics in the sort of you know narrowness of the of the field i'm much more of a generalist so apologies if i'm tripping over my words and uh, not quite no, getting, getting it out. um 
but you know, I, I, I kind of wanted to go back to almost actually what I think it was Thomas who said something that, um, you know, the skills are implicit and they, 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 they kind of make their way to the, the surface. Uh, and I'm also speaking from someone who has got friends who I studied with who now work in public office, you know, in, in the architecture department or the, the planning department of the Glasgow City Council, um, as well as other people who have went off and done completely different things from, you know, kind of non creative industries in the oil industry to um, other kind of creative industries and um, people around my year who now design watches or, or do other things um, which is really nice to see so I think the I think as as Thomas said the the, the, the sort of pedagogy or the, the sort of delivery does kind of make its way there with some people um, but I also just think I, I mean it's the same with maybe I don't know if this is too much of a broad stroke sort of statement but the sort of debate around diversity in, in, uh, in architectural teaching today is that if you can't see it, you don't imagine it kind of thing. So, um, or you imagine yourself in, in that role. Um, so I think just opening up to, 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 um, to have more, more direct experience with people like say Thomas um, come in and, 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 and talk to architecture students, especially an undergraduate, because I would imagine that the undergraduate point is, a, is, the, is, is the kind of point where that kind of break happens a lot of the time um, or, or for most people, for the majority. Um, uh, and especially for people who maybe aren't going into what would be termed creative practice, it's maybe the, but have still got those kind of soft skills or, or, or sort of um, strategy kind of thinking that are really useful to. Um, so I think undergraduate um, as a kind of place to, to hit it hardest uh, and, um, and also just exposure and, and, and inviting people um, and to be part of the kind of teaching cohort, um, so that the, you know, whether whether that's in studio or whether it's more of a of a kind of um, cross school kind of one to many type delivery, um, might be more appropriate. That's great. And so, so Roberta and Claire, there's the provocation. There's the one solution for the academy that we we, we keep it alive, but we we bring other people in. Roberta, is that is that one tactic strategy? I mean. I don't know. <laughs> like, this has been the sort of controversy of the past year. It's like, how do we make the, how do we expand the curriculum? How do we make it more equitable? How do we bring other stories in? And it's a, it doesn't happen like that. It's a cultural shift, which is going to take a long time to happen. Um, yeah, definitely. It's like we will, we're trying. <laughs> we're trying to bring more stories in. We're trying to bring different people in, different perspectives. To encourage the students, crucially, I think, to question everything that they're given as well. I mean, no one says this is the truth. This is the history. Go and get it and apply it. Or this is what you're going to do in practice. Try and apply. So we're trying to open it up for the students to find their own questions. In terms of the relationship between academia and practice. This is another, I think, really hot topic. Um, before curating this book, I curated another book, which was called, uh, it was an issue of AD, called um, The Business of Research, Knowledge and Learning Redefined in Architectural Practice. And again, I had invited public practice to be a contributor, so um, here we are again. But there was this idea that the boundaries or the roles between that, that, that historically academia used to have and practice used to have had sort of blurred into one another. So for instance, before you could say academia is where knowledge is produced and it's evaluated on the basis that you produce a paper and then how many times that paper is cited and produce new knowledge and that's valuable. Whereas in practice, you make a building and you work on, you, if you produce research is around materials, how to apply them and other things like that. And increasingly, because on the one hand, schools more and more with public funded fundings being reduced, they have to apply for private sector fundings or research fundings or whatever. So they have to be accountable for the research that they do. More and more, they work like private practices, like mm. trying to get their own private clients in basically. Whereas the, on the other hand, like private practices, so um, 
as called architectural practices, they have to redefine what they do because in the face of AI being able to design a building or in the face of, um, I don't know, it's like a, a bunch of other actors coming into the construction industry, they have to be able to find different clients that like uh, High Art Blog does. And so for instance, like being able to appeal to certain grants, being able to get into certain research funds and they start producing knowledge within the yeah. practice themselves. So again, like, what I think what Claire was saying, which I think is really interesting, is not so much academia, which needs to you know be shaken up like that, but is in certain academic language which doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help the students when they are in academia, it doesn't help people who want to engage with academia, even if like the knowledge is being produced there and it's like really important. Um, but it's very difficult to be accessed. And you know, academia is working on that too. So I don't know if Claire, that's what you were trying to say. Yeah, I think, I just think there's, I mean, there always has been this, that kind of boundary between academia and practice as kind of separate fields somehow. And I mean, that, yeah, kind of accessing the knowledge, as you just said, is kind of the key problem. And I think so, a lot of, you know, universities are now sort of working on live projects, which I think are a really good way of kind of bringing the real world into the academy. Um, and I don't know, I mean, myself, I, I'm a, a recovering academic, I like to say. So I, I've got a PhD, I, I was on my academic career path, lecturer for the best part of 10 years. And one of the reasons that I took the public practice role was because I was kind of, I was sick of working on research that would then go behind the paywall of a journal, an academic peer reviewed journal to be judged by fellow academics. Even if it was about practice, it wasn't accessed by practitioners. It wasn't read, you know, I published my PhD as a book. Most of my friends are architects. None of them read it. Like <laughs> it's about architecture, but it, it I, I was so frustrated with this disconnect between academia and the kind of research I was doing and the reality of the built environment outside my door there was no relationship between the two so yeah I mean the res research we call it research at public practice but it's not research in in kind of an academic way it's kind of it's research through practice as opposed mm -hmm. to or on practice we might say um and it's, I don't know, it's an evolving model and we're kind of thinking about how how we kind of start to, as public practice, lift up beyond these kind of really micro tools and kind of things I described in my talk towards something that can be a bit more strategic or um, build relationships with academia and maybe do partnered research that it's still root, it has that root in practice and maybe we are the kind of the knowledge exchange as academics like to call it, that kind of exchange between the real world and the academy. That's great. So I can add to that. Um, mm. One of the things which I also do in my own practice, advising um, architectural practices themselves, is trying to find ways of creating a partnership. So, as you were saying, Claire, it's like the question, more often than not, needs to come from, uh, I wouldn't call it the real world, but a world which is in touch with the actual problems or is able to frame them and then the kind of research that you're able to do within academia is a research which you just can't do in practice like it takes time it allows you to go in depth it, allow, it, it takes lots of reading and lots of thinking about how to express that question better but there is an interrelationship I think between these two these two realms one which increasingly is becoming more and more relevant and, uh, and, and maybe it's like it, it, it is probably one of the roots to expressing the true value of both research within architecture, but also practice within architecture. Yeah, and, and, and partnership building. So um, we've got two jobs to do. I want to get to Thomas, who's got a good question. And then while I'm going to go through Thomas's question, I'm going to extend this and ask all three groups, if you like, I want you to tell the audience if you had to go and build network, because I think what you're doing, Roberta and Claire, is expanding the network that we should be in. So if architects need to be in broader networks, 
inside the academy, outside the academy, if all the panelists could think for a moment what uh, one, two, three networks they should involve in. So I'll ask you in a minute, what partnerships are the priority to be, to be made? What, what new connections should all practicing architects and academics start building? So who are, your, who are, you, who are the people that anyone on the call should be going to connect with to extend this partnership breadth? And so that's your question. But while you're thinking about that, um, Cam, could you highlight Thomas um, and let him pitch this um, last question from the audience, as it were, um, and I'll return back to, so while he's asking his question, who who do you network with first? Right, sorry, Thomas. Um, yeah, thanks. Sorry for asking two questions. I just, um, sorry. <laughs> that's good. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about um, what, uh, you Claire were saying about the sorts of things you ask in your interview and recruitment process and you know, I was thinking then back to you know the process of, of graduation when I was at university and you know when push comes to shove you put your work up on you know a wall presentation and you you present things and you're marked in a certain way with certain parameters and there are skills that perhaps aren't marked at that point, like your ability to work in a team or your ability to build a team or, you know, um, engage with someone outside of architecture, things that I would imagine are important um, in the sorts of work that you're doing, Claire. And I, I wonder whether, it, and it's not, a, it's not a issue that I think is unique to architecture. I think a lot of university subjects have a way of grading and marking that is maybe not reflective of what people then go on to do after graduation. I wonder if you had any ideas of, around this and if you thought that there was another way of, um, you know, assessing students in, that might help um, value some of the skills that you feel that architects have, but perhaps aren't aware of having. Good question. <laughs> I definitely think they should. And I, I know the, the last programme that I taught on we definitely assessed group work you know setting setting tasks group presentations and things like that and I think maybe that's the key is it's not just assessing through portfolio and essay but assessing through some kind of active activity um, um, convening a talk or a round table you know being that mediator or yeah building a team um, engaging with the community something that's um not a kind of static thing that you submit but yeah a task of some description i think that's a really good idea it did it, it did ask it, it pulls into a whole bunch of questions thomas what are our learning outcomes and if they're if they're learning outcomes within the discipline you're absolutely right they, they might be good for qualify demonstrating qualification in a discipline but they're not necessarily demonstrating qualification alongside other disciplines so it's um yeah, I think we've got some work to do there, actually, to be honest, because we tend to be so introverted in qualifying people rather than extending their bridges. OK, I'm going to so I'm aware of time, so I'm going to go round now. Um, ben, Sasha and Sean. So there we are. The audience are going to ring up three people or they're going to Google three people on the Internet tonight who they need to break out of their bubble and connect with. What type of people are they? Ben? Well, I can, I can start with one that I think ties in quite well to what Claire was just saying around community engagement. And that is, I think one of the things that we are very interested in is how new technology can create new types of community engagement and new forms of participatory processes. And so maybe along this lines, it's interesting to reach out and look at things like game developer communities, which is not typically what an architect would look at, but there are a series of platforms and softwares there that are designed to bring people into a game, to get their creative input and feedback into a game, and to really kind of tap into vast networks of, of individual creativity. And I think there are so, or we think there are so many potentials within game development and the softwares that game developers use that could be used also within, uh, you know, traditional or more traditional urban and architectural participatory processes that would engage the community in, in both a more fruitful way and with better uh, and, and more diverse information. So that would be right. one, I think. That's great. OK, let's go to Sasha and Sean. Who am I going to ring? Who should I ring? <laughs> uh, I guess for 
I guess, to tap into like new societal trends, then I guess connecting with some social media, either companies or people that are within the social media kind of spectrum. Um, and I don't know if you want to go for the last one. Well, and I guess what we talked about, about the NFTs and stuff like this, would be good to look into blockchain um, developers and it would be really nice to integrate it closer uh, within architectural processes and actually find these new financial models so when we don't look for a client and they pay uh, whatever seven percent and that's how job's done but maybe uh, yeah community contributes and um it's also shared ownership or maybe uh, we discussed before um it's a matter of uh when you enter the building that's when you uh, pay a share to actually experience it so that's how it's funded so there's many different ways like like we think architecture can explore uh, to actually finance um it's okay. and maybe if you you pull those all together as well but like you can learn a lot from the game industry of like just simple things and the process of what and the way that games are made through either like how do you drive people through a space how do you connect them to the next space how do you like it's all like it, it, from a very like simple architectural way, it is super architectural, but also really like quite simple architecture. It's things that we learn in first and second year at uni and then forget in third year and forget when we move on to masters. Um, but you can also learn from like play testing and all these different types of uh, connecting with people. And maybe if you want, connect with a game designer to, to, to develop a new, a new software to, to design architecture Great. collaboratively or in a new way. Great, really, really strong stress. And then, and um, let's think. Leanne has come in with a, a connection to connection to Ben's suggestion. Right. So, Claire, who am I going to ring? Who am I going to um, ring? I'm going to be very brief so I can see we're at eight thirty. Um, local community groups, leaders, you know, um, and local politicians. Your local MP, your local councillors. Fantastic. Keeping it public sector. <laughs> Brilliant. And we're going to disrupt all the ecosystems here. And to finish off, Roberta, who do I ring tonight? <laughs> um, I'm going to say we all have to go out networking with non-humans. I got wow. through a brilliant presentation yesterday by Lindsay Bremmer. And she has this project in which the monsoon um, is an agent of co-production. So she has reconceptualized the weather, not as this thing that is just like hanging above our heads, but an agent of production of space with whom we have to work with because um, the planet and climate change is not something that is going to be solved unless we feel that we are part of it. We're not imposing our will on the planet, but we are part of this bigger network of things. Great. What a fantastic, I mean, what a great bookend. Thank you so much. Thinking outside and thinking of the planet as a space to um, uh, make sure things architect has a responsibility toward. So I think I'm going to hand back to the um, the team. Um, shall we do that? And then I think thank you so much, everybody. Um, shall we close out? Have you got any closing um, points? I think perhaps Louisa um, and show. Yeah, I've just kind of got the the boring closing up stuff. So um, yeah, I just want to pay a huge thanks to all our provocateurs this evening. Um, our audience um, and our participation, the participation from the audience has been really animated tonight. Um, and of course, our facilitation from Chris, which has been invaluable for us to kind of draw out threads of discussion um, and navigate some of the complex issues facing practice and the in industry in general. Um, yeah, it's been so interesting to see the lines of questioning tonight, um, sort of highlighting the need for change, really. Um, yeah, as Roberta notes, like what happens if we think beyond the building and realign ourselves with our soft skills and um, some things that are maybe slightly stifled in practice um, and reflect on avenues that are certainly not obvious to us when you're kind of driving towards your seven years um, or whatever it ends up being. Uh, yeah, and um, so during the Fringe, we've been able to consider how events or times of disruption as we've seen in the last year, can trigger a change in attitude, um, but it's also brought us together. So I think we can build on that momentum and um, bring about a culture of change. Um, yeah, there's been some really engaging discussion tonight, which I think could have gone on into another event. 
uh, and there's a lot to take away. So I hope everyone's feeling inspired. Um, yeah, I'll hand over to Shona. Thanks, Lisa. Um, just a couple of reminders again. Uh, I noted in the chat that we've got a resource and reading um, list that we're creating for this event and the first round table, um, and we'd invite you all to add to that. We're going to ask our contributors to put in some links in there too. Um, so if you could check that out, that'd be great. We're also going to include that as part of the transcript um, when this recording's published on YouTube. Um, just a reminder that we're all volunteers here at the Architecture Fringe, and I hope you've enjoyed tonight. Um, if you would like to continue to support us, we'd be grateful if you could visit our Patreon page and also follow us on social media and like and share posts. Um, tickets for other events forming part of the core programme and open programme can be booked via the website architecturefringe.com. Uh, and just to plug a couple of things that are coming up, we've got some lunchtime talks uh, for new spatial realities tomorrow and Friday. And on Friday evening, we've got our graduate showcase launch, um, which is celebrating the submissions from graduates from all five Scottish schools of architecture and landscape architecture. Um, and that's it. So thanks very much for everyone who came tonight. Um, we've really enjoyed all your contributions and I hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you.